presiding, Judge David Tremberg was shown the shocking footage of Anya Michi's rampage. Evidence that it was so out of control, a special team of riot officers needed to be called in. They are the elite officers. They are sent to the most dangerous situations and they're given the most training. This is a particularly extreme example of their use. It took 100 officers to control or attempt. 100 officers, you know. 100 officers for one guy, blood. To control one man. The footage showed damage which cost the prison £15,000. It has to be serious for 100 officers to go in. It can't be just somebody's throwing a little bit of a tantrum or throwing the dummy out. It has to be a real threat to life. The CCTV footage showed that with 100 specially trained officers on the wing, Onya Michi became increasingly frantic. He jumps onto the netting between two parts of that particular wing and runs along it. He's out of control. We're back again. Mm. So I'm going to be reacting to HMP Full Sutton. So HMP Full Sutton is like a maximum security prison. They got the worst of the worst of the worst in this prison. Uh, big up the man them in Full Sutton though, because uh, some of them man they watch my content and that. So I imagine, yeah, some of the, the toppest killers of that, they are potentially watching my content. Imagine that. Anyway, let's get into it because this one is an interesting one still. Let's go, fam. Even their starting music. Dong. Let's peel that back. You know this ain't no little kids movie, yeah? <laughs> this ain't fucking Pinocchio or Pocahontas or Aladdin, yeah? Home to nearly 600 convicted criminals, this is HMP Full Sutton. A prison built to house Britain's most dangerous men. HMP Full Sutton is a high security prison purpose built in 1987. It was created for the most dangerous and difficult category A and category B prisoners. People who presented a real risk to the community were they to be let out. In 1965, two of the great train robbers had escaped from prison. As a result of Victorian prison, such as Wakefield... So train robbers is not people that jump on the train and hijack the train. I mean, well, in the history of the world, there's probably people that have done that, but train robbers, back in the day, man would get on a train and just rob everyone on the train. They'll be rolling around with their magnum revolver or their pistol, whatever, and they'll just... They'll come with a big bag and, hey, put your stuff in. That's just how it goes. One with Scrubs, Hull and Parkhurst, uh, which were uh, effectively turned in to category prisons. But one of the problems with that, of course, was that security had to be hung on old structures that were not built for that particular purpose. As a result, they built some new prisons, and Full Sutton was one of those prisons. Full Sutton was to contain the worst criminals in Britain, and so it needed to be constructed with a formidable design. This would be a massively secure prison. They had four units that were built when the prison was first opened, and known as a courtyard design. It was designed not like a Victorian prison, which usually had a central hub and then straight wings off it. Full Sutton, by contrast, was designed in a slightly different way, which meant it was made in quadrangles. Basically, they were on a square. There was no windows, cells either side, and a, an exercise yard in the middle. I mean, that's how I felt on this. If there's an exercise yard in the middle, and then obviously, yeah, you've got the, the, the wings surrounding it. And there were walls around them on all sides. They would also then have the prison walls and the other barriers that would prevent escape. Prisoners, they're going to find it very intimidating. It's never had an escape, which is remarkable. It's a secure regime. Sentenced to life here, you'll have been convicted of the most heinous of crimes. Killers, serial rapists, child molesters. If you like, 
Full Sutton has the worst of the worst. Full Sutton has been home to some of Britain. Big up man like Charles Bronson, number four, you know. Apparently they rate Charles Bronson as... Yeah, Britain's most violent uh, prisoner. So, put it this way, they, they, sent him, they sent him to normal prison, wherever it was and that. He got kicked out of normal prison, went to a psychiatric prison, got kicked out of there, and he's back in normal prison. I don't even know where he is right now. I'm going to search it. Britain's most notorious criminals. Inmates who've been locked up here include... Dennis Nielsen is among Britain's most famous serial killers. Dale Cregan, the Manchester gangster who killed two uniformed police women. David Mulcahy, the so-called railway rapist who became a serial killer. Daniel Restivo, hair fetishist who brutally killed a lady in Bournemouth. So they'd arrive normally by sweatbox bus, which brings them in. If you're a Category A inmate entering Full Sutton, you'll arrive at the prison under the highest level of security. We get to the main gates of the prison, which are electronic, they move to the side, we move in. Then somebody comes out of the office with like a stick and a big mirror on it, so they can look underneath the van to make sure nothing's being brought in. So allegedly, Charles Bronson is in um, HMP Woodhill, which is in uh, Milton Keynes. They get taken in through to reception, where they get booked in. They get searched. You'll go through the process of being strip searched. You'll put a set of clothing on. Squat and cough. <coughs> Get your bags when they go through, they'll have these machines with all your toiletries, your foods, your clothes, just to see if it picks up any metals or any hidden phones and that kind of stuff. And then they'll be taken by the reception staff through to the, whatever wing they're going to be living on. But on the walk to your wing, Full Sutton's austere design will give an unsettling sense of what it feels like to be an inmate at this prison. But the music, blood. <laughs> the music and sound effects, they know exactly what they do. But on the walk to your wing, Full Sutton's austere design will give an unsettling sense of what it feels like to be an inmate at this prison. You have to go through a lot of security between sort of 10 and 15 doors and gates from the entrance to where your wing is. As soon as we went inside the building, it very quickly became disorientating. I had no idea what floor I was on, which way I was pointing, north, south, east, west. I had no clue. It's eerie and claustrophobic and quite depressing. It smells strange as well. Even the prison officer who was taking me to the wing said the same thing. He said, can you smell the place? And I could. And he said, you just get used to it. I didn't get used to it in the whole time that I was there. There's just a stench and a smell that makes your stomach turn. I don't know whether it's just me, but I think there's many men who will tell you the same thing. It's like it sucks you in. It feels like you've been Sucked in. Leroy Smith, you know he's of Jamaican descent, boy. To avoid your legs that feel wobbly. Doom's the best way I can describe it. Walking onto a wing can be pretty daunting. You'll be looking up, you'll be looking down, who's there, who's there. If you don't know your way around, if it's all new, you don't know who's going to be there. You want to meet old friends because you want to feel safe in this new environment because it is frightening. There is no doubt about that. On your first day on the square wings of Full Sutton, you'll soon realise... <laughs> the music and the sound effects, I'm telling you. Ice, ...that its unusual layout poses some serious problems. The courtyard design has design faults, such as 
inaccessible areas or areas where people can escape surveillance. You've got all these little corridors, all these little stairways. I didn't know where I was. There's no natural light or anything like that. And the way they're laid out to walk landing to landing, you have to go round blind corners. There was no windows, there was nothing. Once you were in there, you could have been beaten to death and nobody would have known. People would ambush you. If you haven't noticed by now, the person's name is Sarah Jane, but that is not a woman. Move your blood clot from my screen. People will just hold you up and oh, rob you. Do you know what? You can have weeks and stuff where it's just chilled out. It's it, Nothing really happens. And then you can have months where it's just constant. There's been times when people have had hits put on them and they've not even known who did the hit. Because someone's just put their arm around the corner and threw the water in their face and just vanished. There are places that you could hide, not like a Victorian prison, which usually has straight wings, which made it easier for the prison officers to see a wing. It's interesting that the old Victorian designers probably had a better idea of how to control desperate men than someone in 1987 designing a new maximum security prison. Next, Britain's most violent inmates turned their anger towards the staff. I genuinely feared for my life. I didn't think I was coming out of there. Oh, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that, that's normal. If you are a prison officer, if you are a prison gov, you can expect to be assaulted and I remember when I was on when I was in um ISIS, H and P ISIS, which is in Thamesmead, SE twenty eight O N Z. I still remember the fucking postcode, blood. It was during the time of the riots and that, and for some reason everyone wanted to start rioting on the ring. But it weren't no serious thing like but people just didn't want to go in their cells and that. Anyway, I remember the man then on the wing, like at the top, we were just walking around in a circle being fools and that. And someone took you know the cleaning brush, that dirty toilet cleaning brush, that white thing with the, the brush bristles on it? And threw it at this, there was a prison guard, a woman, threw it at her head. Imagine, man used that brush to clean shit and piss in their toilet and they threw it at her head, you know? Fuck free blood. It's a top security prison in East Yorkshire. And on your first day here, you'll have to quickly adapt to its strict routine. Daily life at Full Sutton is very routine based. At around seven in the morning, um, there's an unlock, so everybody is let out. They can get their hot water, they can empty their bins, they can get a shower, do all of their sort of daily life essentials, basically. Then the majority of prisoners go to work. There's a labour board which, which tells you where you're employed. And you've got landing one, landing two, landing three, the cell numbers, my name, your name, prison number, your place of work. At that time, there was things like a, a braille sh workshop, a motorcycle repair workshop, painting and decorating, and then there were jobs on the wings, cleaning the wing, keeping it tidy. See, if when I was in prison, if I was there long enough, I would have been a cleaner. I like cleaning, so, yeah. It's actually similar to a normal society, really, other than you can't just wander off on your own. At 3 p.m., everyone will come back from workshops. They're normally allowed a few hours of sort of association time. During that time, they can play pool, they can interact with each other as much as they want. You can socialise, cook your food and go on the telephone, go to the gym or whatever. That's the highlight of the day. And then what happens at about 7 o'clock is they all get locked up for the night. Uh, the night staff come in and then everyone is locked up until 7 o'clock the next morning. Despite being in prison, there is one kind of freedom the inmates at Full Sutton can experience. In Full Sutton, you're allowed to cook your own food, and some people are really good chefs, and they can cook really, really good. So, like... <laughs> See his face? And they can cook really good. Watch his face, man. Despite being in prison... They can cook really good. There is one kind of freedom the inmates at Full Sutton can experience. In Full Sutton, you're allowed to cook your own food, and some people are really good chefs, and they can cook really, really good. So, like, you'll get some Jamaican guys can cook some serious food. 
some Asian brothers cook some serious food. Some people are living better in there with their food standards than out in society, yes. Because... Yeah, for real, you, you got... You know what I'm saying? You got thousands of hours to perfect your teeth. Plus, you got other men in there that can show you how to do this and that. Of course, your cooking standards are going to be better than people outside on the road. You ain't got nothing else better to do, blood. Nothing else to do apart from to cook. And you can walk about the wing with a nine inch kitchen blade. Did you know that? In the top security prisons. You go in the office, sign out a nine inch kitchen blade. So you can imagine how paranoid everyone is. No, and then you're in a top security prison, you walk about with big nine inch kitchen blades. They know not to use that knife to stab anyone because otherwise they're going to take it away from all of us. They'll go and get their own knife to stab someone if they want to stab someone. Some people are just sensible and they've got their head screwed on. They know that if they go down that route, it's not going to be nice for them. They know if they go down that route, they're never going to get out. So they're sensible. They want to they use their head, get in, do your jail and get out of prison. That's sensible. Because if you don't know, if you didn't know, when you're in prison, if you do stuff like get caught with a phone, get caught smoking weed, or fail a piss test because you've got weed in your system and that, but that's extra days, blood. If you have a fight in prison, or like, maybe not a fight, but if you assault like a prison governor, that, extra days. Yeah, I mean, you can get extra days for a fight, really. So, yeah, man. There's certain people, they've gone in jail just for a year and that end up having to do an extra three months because of you getting involved with something. They're selling drugs and that. To make it through your first day, you'll still need to watch your back as a violent attack could be just around the corner. The stress level, it's just crazy. If you look at someone for too long, they'll start thinking, what are you staring at us for? You must be plotting something. Next thing you know, they're running in your cell and stabbing you up because you looked at them wrong. Everywhere that I went, I'd have at least two biro pens on me that I could use for weapons. The whole environment of it, you, you end up buying into it. Extreme violence can come out of nowhere. It could be anything. It could be spontaneous. It could be someone made a mistake and didn't say sorry. It can come from anywhere. I would say the majority of incidences start off as very minor incidental things. Me and my friend went to the um, surgery and we were the last at the servery. And just Rocky biscuits, you know, the Rocky chocolate biscuits. Everyone else had got one. Big up the Rocky bars, them. Yeah, I remember eating them in secondary school and that. that's when I first discovered them. And I mean, within the last probably 18 months, I've had, probably had a pack or two. But there was none left for us when we got there. We nearly, nearly went into a riot over a chocolate Rocky biscuit. Things that are nothing to me and you at the time, like, they're huge in prison. And little things become massive things and people are willing to kill you over just the slightest of stuff. And, and you become like that too. The first evening I got into that prison, I had my face punched in. I went to get my food. And this guy that I didn't know said hello to me. He said hello, that was all he said. And I said hello back and the guy just walked up and smashed me in the face and told me that this guy was in for some sexual crime or something and if I talk to him again, next time I'm gonna get stabbed violence it was always there i think the theory must be that if you're gonna put really violent men together there is a danger that they will become even more violent in other words pouring petrol on the flames of their inherent violence with dangerous men and makeshift weapons full sutton can be a ticking time bomb and there's only so long the staff can keep control. It is inevitable that things will slip through the net in a place like Full Sutton. No matter where you work in a prison, you are outnumbered. Some of them just enjoy violence, and if they want to take the wing over or create problems, there is not a lot you can do, quite frankly. And it was even worse when this prison was first opened. When you walk into a new prison, it's chaotic. They ain't got a clue. Staff don't know each other. The staff don't know the prisoners. The prisoners don't know the staff. The prisoners don't know the other prisoners. Problems have arisen for very obvious reasons. Three years after Full Sutton opened, these issues became too big for the prison to handle. Whether it was by design or default, we ended up with a lot of fairly new officers in particular who were basically fresh off the street working with these 
very difficult types of offenders. How have you got fresh prison staff that have just come out of training, whatever their training consists of, and throwing them in a maximum security prison with some serious man? No, you put them newbies in category C or even cat D prisons. So a cat D prison is like open prison, like you get to go home and you know what I'm saying? Like you go home for the weekend and come back. So it's people that are near the end of their sentence, people that want to behave. You put the new, fresh newbies with them sort of people there because they're going to be easier to handle. Who do you think is going to be easier to handle? People that are going home soon who want to behave so that they have their freedom and privileges and that, or people who don't know when they're coming out or, you know what I'm saying, that they're in there for 25 years for murders and you've got serial killers, serial rapists and that. It's better that they put them fresh newbies in a prison with people them that want to behave themselves and that and easy to manage then people that are not easy to manage and difficult uh, got bad behavior and that you put those, those sorts of prisons and that you need more experienced older um, prison gubs man not no no young fresh newbie for some reason we had a, a bad mix of prisoners as well on some of the wings they tried to intimidate staff successfully on many occasions and a lot of the managers left the uniformed officers just to get on with it. And um, quite frankly, we, we lost the prison. On the weed wall around, to do what we wanted to, people drinking, taking drugs, it was just mental. Losing control would make prison officers' jobs at Full Sutton even more challenging. In effect, prisoners are kind of doing what they want. Searches aren't done properly because staff have been intimidated. Seawing, as it was then, full of lifers, eventually got burnt down. We ended up one for about a week. Our prison officers were behind shields. You know, you didn't want to go to work in the morning. In the early 1990s, prison officer Paul found himself fully exposed in the struggle in prison. You have like a TV room. These two guys stayed in there, said they weren't coming out. So I went in there to try and reason with them. The next thing I know was they'd slammed the door behind me. They got the big uh, table legs, smashed them up, and threatened me, you know, my school was going to be next. I was trying to be confident, trying to be relaxed, but inside, my stomach was churning, my knees were, were rocking a bit, and um, it was not a nice feeling at all. And I genuinely feared for my life. I didn't think I was coming out of there. It can be very intimidating. A lot of the prisoners there are very tall, very masculine men. Sometimes they can use that almost against you. You have to just stand your ground and try your hardest to really put on that brave face that none of this is really affecting you. The principal officer, she came down to the wing know whether it's some gangster rule that you don't hit women or you don't, you know, treat women in that way. But thankfully, she managed to persuade them to come out. Though Paul's ordeal was over, life at Full Sutton was never the same again. I must admit, I did lose quite a lot of confidence after that. I still get quite emotional even thinking about it now because it's, um, you know, it was a very emotional time for me. But staff at Full Sutton would be tested again, this time by a volatile inmate from London convicted of attempted murder. John Onyamichi, he was a man for whom violence was second nature. He was, to some extent, a career criminal. He had track record of violence, use of drugs. He'd been in prison before, had scant regard for authority, he has this extraordinary outburst in Ealing where a policeman and a community support officer who's patrolling with him had his throat cut. In fact, it was astonishing that he survived. This was brutal, vicious, entirely unwarranted attack. And quite rightly, he was given a very long prison sentence as a result. In two <laughs> Life a maniac who did this to cop maniac, you know. 2011, on Yamichi was... That's the thing, you go to prison 
and you'll be banged up in the cell with someone else, and days, weeks, months into your setters, you're having to learn that your cellmate that is in the top or bottom bunk is a maniac. Yeah, you're having to learn that this guy is not right in his head, blood. Held at the Old Bailey for a minimum of 25 years for the attack. During his sentence, he would arrive at HMP Full Sutton. I met John on my first day as an officer in Full Sutton. He was just a mountain of a man, absolutely huge, uh, extremely intimidating. I met him on a number of occasions. He's a serious man. If you're going to fall out with him, you're going to have to have to end up doing something really serious, otherwise he's going to have you. He just towered over everybody. He was such a large presence of a man that you couldn't help but look and wonder what happens if he decides he doesn't want to be around you or, or doesn't want to do what you say. Where, where do you go from there? Eight years into his sentence, Onya Michi would be back in court, this time for an attack that had shocked Full Sutton. He decided that he wanted to take over the wing. He was difficult to restrain by staff, was fighting back, and was out of control. Hull Crown Court was shown footage of the shocking attack at Full Sutton, which took place on August the 9th, 2018. Onyamichi goes on this rampage. He hits a prison officer over the head from behind with a heavy pan, steals his keys, starts a fire in the kitchen, piles magazines and shoes and puts a chair and sets light to that. The attack went on for eight hours, but this footage, lasting 10 minutes, was played in court. What would happen if somebody was sort of kicking off in that manner? Is the wing staff deal with it? With the size of him and his level of violence, it was extremely hard for wing staff to even make an attempt. He was using pool cues and pots and pans he could get a hold of to attempt to attack other prisoners and staff. He's really out of control, and the prison officers can't cope. I mean, not surprisingly, he's an incredibly intimidating figure, and he's clearly out of his mind. Presiding, Judge David Tremberg was shown the shocking footage of Onya Michi's rampage, evidence that it was so out of control, a special team of riot officers needed to be called in. They are the elite officers. They are sent to the most dangerous situations, and they're given the most training. This is a particularly extreme example of their use. It took 100 officers to control or attempt to... 100 officers, you know. 100 officers for one guy, blood. Control, one man. The footage showed damage which cost the prison 15,000 pounds. It has to be serious for 100 officers to go in. It can't be just somebody's throwing a little bit of a tantrum or throwing their dummy out. It has to be a real threat to life. The CCTV footage showed that with 100 specially trained officers on the wing, Onyamichi became increasingly frantic. He jumps onto the netting between two parts of that particular wing and runs along it. He's out of control, he's doing whatever he wants, and he's quite prepared to hit anyone with anything just to get his own way. Finally, he falls through the netting. The prison footage captured this dramatic moment. He fell from the railings and ended up injuring himself. It's like a really solid staircase that he fell down onto and, and just got up and almost continued, which is quite scary. How a man can, you know, survive something like that and... and... To think to yourself, so this guy's a maniac, he's out of control and that. Obviously, as you heard, he slashed a police officer, cut a police officer's throat and that on street, on the road, that's why he ended up in jail. So just think to yourself, imagine living in a flat block, like in the real world, in the outside world, like a normal civilian. Imagine living in a flat block and that guy is your neighbour and he's playing music at two, three in the morning. Imagine having to go next door 
and knocking his door and asking him to turn that down. Boy, imagine how that's going to go down. <laughs> boy, that will be peak, boy. Boy, God forbid, man, have to knock on his door. Just and continue wanting to fight. Even then, he, it takes some time to subdue him. It underlines very vividly that there are certain units in Full Sun that were simply too dangerous. In the end, we were able to take back E-Wing, uh, but it was a long day. He did uh, manage to cause quite a lot of damage. In court, Onya Michi pled guilty to a variety of offences, including ABH, arson and threats to kill. A further custodial sentence was handed down by the judge. The result of the rampage of Onya Michi was that he got another six years added to his sentence. One of his explanations in court when it, this was put to him is he said, I was taking steroids and I didn't know the impact they were having on me. Whether that was true or not, it didn't affect the fact that his sentence was extended. The judge stated, you are clearly a powerful man. You went on the rampage and you cared little for your own safety, let alone that of others. With his sentence extended, Onyamichi would not be eligible for parole until 20... 100, you know, imagine like how... He must be nuts. He must really pose a threat for them to call 100 officers for one man, you know. 2042. Not even 10, 100. It didn't surprise me at all that he would be fighting and it would be a difficult task for them to hold him. Certain men, when they lose it, their only way of expressing how they're feeling would be by way of violence. With Onyamichi convicted for running amok, justice had been served. But for the staff, the most important factor was just getting out alive. There is such a sense of relief amongst staff because it can escalate so quickly. And we go in there to do a job and to go home to our families and sometimes you hear of people not being able to go home to their families because of the environment we work in. And that's a risk that you do take when you start working in a maximum security prison. Onyamichi is a, a classic example of the volatility of a high security prison. It only takes one person to lose it and the whole place is in danger of going up. Onyamichi's rampage was not an isolated incident, as in the years leading up to the attack, assaults on staff in British prisons had nearly tripled. In those environments, prison officers don't feel as though they're safe. You've always got to have that in the back of your mind, but you can't let that affect the job that you do. Next, we move along to Full Sutton's most reviled area, a place known as Beast Wing. The smell is different from normal location. The beastie, beastie, beastie wing. If you're sent to HMP Full Sutton and find yourself amongst Britain's most reviled offenders, then you have arrived on Beast Wing. Beast Wing is just another name for sex offenders or that a blood clot man them the degenerates of the criminal world sex offenders have to be kept away um, because they will be uh, harmed um, some severely some to the point where they probably end up dead if you're a sex offender and you come on normal location you will get hot water thrown over you hot fat thrown over you you will get stabbed to bits someone will get rid of you just for the sake of it, whether it matters to them or not. One long-time inmate on this wing was one of Britain's most notorious killers. The Muswell Hill murderer. Muswell Hill's next to Edmonton. Muswell Hill falls in the borough of Harringay and it's basically next to Hornsey. Uh, where else is it? Near, near Highgate. Yeah, around them sort of size there. Near Crouch End. Probably about 15 minute drive from Wood Green, if that. Dennis Nielsen is among Britain's most famous serial killers. He would pick up floating young men, whether it's in the pub 
or in the street, and he would take them home. But then he began to live out the fantasy, his fantasy from childhood, of possessing a passive young man for sex. And he would strangle them. He disposed of the bodies in a really horrifying way. He dismembered them and he burnt them on a pyre constructed from tires. And he also put some of the flesh down the lavatory. It was this method of disposing of his victims that led to his detection. The moment the police arrive at his door. How the fuck would he get caught for murder? Or, like, I don't know how that brought suspicion to him, like, because he was flushing dead bodies, body parts down the toilet. Like, what do you, what do the sewer people find a foot and think, well, it must be flat A on Herringford Road, N10. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, how the fuck did they know that him putting people's body parts down the toilet, how did that lead to his detection? He's ushered down into the police car to be taken away for interrogation. And the detective says, well, how many people have you killed? And Nielsen says, 15 or 16. At his trial, Nielsen was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Early into that sentence, he arrived at Full Sutton. There's no question that Full Sutton was a logical place to send Dennis Nielsen. He was certainly one of the worst of the worst. He first went to Full Sutton in March 1990, and he was only there for maybe 10 months. He spent the whole time in the segregation unit. It was not the first time Nielsen had been in the segregation unit during his time in prison. He probably went there for his own safety. Prison. I was down the segregation and I didn't have no books in the cell. I asked the prison officer, could I get a book to read for tonight? He goes, uh, how about asking your next door neighbour? I said, he's my next door neighbour. And he said to me, Dennis Nielsen. I said, oh, ain't that the guy that... And he said to me, yeah, that's the guy. He's been down here yonks. I said, well, ask him for me. Came back about 10 minutes later. I said, yeah, compliments of Dennis. And he gave me the book, and it was called Beyond Belief, which was the first ever book written on Myra Hindley and Ian Brady. But I was thinking, of all books, why would you send me that? Nielsen moved around the prison system in the 1990s before returning permanently to Full Sutton in 2001. Dennis Nielsen was a very arrogant person, kind of saw himself as a bit of an intellectual. He would complain at everything and anything. I think he took me to the civil court twice for various things that he felt he was aggrieved about, lost both of them. He just felt he was better than everybody else. The only things that ever created altercation with staff were things such as rules and regulations, a perceived lack of them being applied equally. But at Full Sutton, Nielsen would have bigger problems than the staff. He didn't have any friends in prison. He obviously had acquaintances and he had neighbours, but not friends in any real sense of the word. No one would talk to him. I mean, Someone who chops up 13 people and shoves them down drain holes, that's like, that's not gonna make you friends. That's not how you make friends and influence people in the prison. Yeah, trust me. Yeah, he wants to be my friend. I've just killed about 13, 15 people and flushed them down the toilet. system. A couple of hooded prisoners turned up at his door. He suspected he was gonna be beaten up or even murdered. So he picked up a battery that was on the side of his table and he threw it at them, just as they were tipping over a pan of boiling sugar water. If you're in a top security prison, you can't settle. Watch your back, because it's full of dangerous people. On another occasion, he was in the TV room. The alarm bell went because somebody had lit a fire on his bed. Despite his notoriety, not every prisoner wanted to attack Nielsen. The staff asked me if I would go and play music with him because he had a keyboard. But no, we just played chess or fucking Scrabble. Dennis Nielsen, the Scrabble cheat. So me and Nick in the Scrabble pieces, always looking in his bag to try and get the blanks. 
I think he saw himself as special, that he was the more intelligent of everybody, and that's the arrogance of the man, I suppose. He was nothing. He wasn't ugly. He wasn't attractive. He wasn't short, and he wasn't tall. He was just so average. Nielsen wasn't the only high-profile resident on the wing, as just a few cells down was the man suspected of one of Britain's most evil unsolved crimes, the Babes in the Wood murders. The Babes in the Woods murders. Fucking that sounds like a movie, blood. Russell Bishop was a neighbour four doors down. He was probably the closest he had to what I would class as a normal friend in prison. Russell Bishop was a disturbed, rather unhappy young man. He had developed quite quickly an appetite for very young girls, and he commits what will be his most famous crime, which was nicknamed Babes in the Wood, in 1986. On this particular October day in 1986, Bishop is watching a group of young girls. The girls are playing outside, and the two of them decide they'll go off, buy a bag of chips. They're called Nicola Fellows and Karen Hadaway. Then they go into Wild Park. Bishop is all the time tracking them, with only one objective, which is to sexually assault them. They go to a little hide. In Look at his fucking eyes, boy. <whistles> yeah, he looks bad, boy. He looks wrong, boy. In the wood in Wild Park. And in that particular hide, unfortunately, Russell Bishop killed them. Bishop quickly became the prime suspect. And after being arrested, went on trial for the murders. To the astonishment of the prosecution and the police, Bishop is found not guilty. He truly is an evil man, and he got away with it. Despite getting away with murder, Bishop's reign of terror continued. In February 1990, he attacks another young girl, this time age seven. Inevitably. With these guys who, like, so, if a guy kills someone on the street in a fight or whatever, those sorts of people probably would never re-offend. Uh, let's say they even got away with it. But these guys who are serial killers that prey on people and that, left unchecked, they would have a body count of 200. They would drop 200 people because they're addicted to it. They think it's a game. They think it's fun. Might as well bear their murder investigation things and that. And the one guy in America, he was crazy. He was coming like Texas Chainsaw Massacre sort of shit. One guy must have skinned a woman and put on her skin and was wearing it like leggings and was dancing around in his farm in America. He owned like a big farmland and that. And the guy killed 49 people. When they arrested him, they threw him in uh, like a holding cell. And they had an undercover police officer in there just pretending to be another criminal. Oh, I've been nicked for shoplifting, or I beat up this person. The guy that got arrested for murder, who'd killed 49 people, said to the guy, fuck, man, you know, they caught me, like, <laughs> give it a couple of months, it would have been 50 people. I almost got to the big 5-0. Now, obviously, they couldn't use that as evidence to convict him and that, because obviously he's not being interviewed and that. But at least they knew, right, we have the right person, um, you know, it's just down to us to prove it. Now, obviously, when they went to the pig farm and that, they found all the craziness. There was, like, jars with people's fingers and eyeballs and a woman's breast inside of a jar and all this crazy stuff in it, yeah? But these these people, they were the only reason why they only killed 13, 15, 16 people is because they got caught. I guarantee you, if they made it to the age of 70 years old, they would have a body count of 300. Bishop is convicted and sent to jail. Bishop entered Full Sutton, where he would meet Dennis Nielsen. Bishop lent Des his typewriter when the H fell off Des's own typewriter over Christmas, and he needed to carry on with his writings and his correspondence. So for a period, the two of them became intertwined, really. When I read about his crimes, I expected to see this some crazy monster with some really crazy manic eyes and it was just average just average there's nothing special nothing unique nothing remarkable the only interesting thing that a lot of these serial killers have going for them is their crime because outside of that they're pretty much nobodies 
trust me. Literally, they're as average and as plain as they come. But long into his prison sentence, the weight of his crimes became too much. Russell Bishop confessed effectively to a fellow inmate at Full Sun that he was guilty of killing Nicola and Karen, the Babes in the Wood murders. And in 2018, some considerable time after the original deaths of Nicola and Karen in 1986, he's tried for the Babes in the Wood murder and is quite rightly convicted. But in the end, Bishop wouldn't serve much of that sentence. There was a little justice somewhere at the end because Bishop died in 2022 of terminal cancer. So after so long in prison, what made Bishop finally confess? I think it was bragging, not remorse, that made him tell a fellow prisoner. I think Bishop didn't suffer any guilt. I think he was just rather proud of it and proud that he got away with it for so long. Bishop's death closed a dark chapter in British criminal history, and he proved to be one of the very few acquaintances that Dennis Nielsen ever had in full Sutton. Dennis Nielsen was, as I remember, uh, just an old shell of a man, to be honest. He was quiet, he kept to himself. He'd sit in his room in his little white underwear and read his book and write his poems. In his final years, he was slowing down. He was tiring of most things, and his health was slowly fading. I'd definitely say he had a very sad existence in his final years. He was very isolated from what I saw. It usually happens with older prisoners. If they're reasonably infamous as well, they tend to isolate themselves even further because their crime becomes very well known. People on the wing know who they are and what they've done. On the 10th of May 2018, Dennis Nielsen was transferred to York Hospital, citing stomach pains. He would die there two days later at the age of 72. It does just become part of life in there that people come and go and people die, and people like that die as well. The prison moves on. In there, you are just another number who will come and go. So, who was the real Dennis Nielsen? We give him far too much credit for being what he used to be like and not the sad old man dying in a prison cell, which is what he was in the end. He wasn't a, a man with horns or a tail or a big black cloak or staring eyes. He was absolutely ordinary chap. Evil does not come printed on your forehead. Often it's extremely banal. They're ordinary men who don't stand out in the crowd. Next, inside Full Sutton's most reviled wing, one of the most notorious revenge attacks in the prison's history. It was a monstrous attack. Britain's worst paedophile. HMP Full Sutton houses some criminals so despised that they are kept apart for their own protection. But even on Beast Wing, there is no love lost for these offenders. Sex offenders, the worstest of the worst. The scourge of the earth, the beasts. There are ordinary sex offenders, your rapist, uh, and then there are child sex offenders, and they are the bottom of the bottom. There is a hierarchy amongst sex offenders. For example, people who've committed crimes against women, they'll look down on people who've committed crimes against children. And then people who've maybe committed crimes against one child, you quite often see them looking down on people who've committed crimes against multiple children. I have heard prison. Yeah, that is foolishness. <laughs> that is foolishness, a hierarchy, you know, but Everyone wants to feel like they're better than someone else, obviously, in it, and someone else is more inferior than them. I was actually saying, well, I only raped a woman, you raped a child. I guess it's like anything, you know, we as human beings want other people to be worse than us, don't we? One inmate that every prisoner would look down on was the man who would become known as Britain's worst ever paedophile. Richard Look at him. He looks twisted, boy. 
Fucking hell. Richard Huckle used to take regular trips to Malaysia to effectively abuse children, but always presented himself as a sort of English teacher and... Well, I could imagine a lot of guys doing that now to this day. You know, when I hear about guys from over in the UK going over to Thailand, you know, I don't want to bring any race or colour into it, so I'm not going to. But when I hear certain demographics of uh, men going over to Thailand and that, I think, hmm, either they're going over there for lady boys or they're going over there to abuse children. You know what I'm trying to say? Like, I don't even want to say, but basically, there's an older guy that I don't know him personally, someone that I've met. You get me? One of them man there, non menelated skin. You understand what I'm trying to say? He um, was retiring from his business in the UK. And apparently, yeah, we heard that, yeah, he's moving to Thailand. And I'm like, why the fuck are you? You're English. Why are you moving over to Thailand? You have no family over there. And I'm just thinking, probably lady boys and or small children this person wants to be fasting themselves up with. Now, I remember this was years ago. This is like well, seven years ago, I was thinking that. Philanthropist he was a member of a dark web group called the Love Zone. He was writing a manual for paedophiles on how to make it happen, how to make it work. He bragged that young people in developing countries were much easier to seduce than middle class people in England. But after a multinational investigation, look at him. Huckle's crimes came to light. Huckle, quite rightly, was eventually a court, indeed arrested by the National Crime Agency at Gatwick Airport after a tip-off from the Australians. He was eventually charged with 91 offences and pleaded guilty to 71. His victims ranged from six months to 12 years. Six months? How the, f How the hell does a man even get close to I mean, obviously, the parents were trusting and that, obviously. Fucking stupid people. In June 2016, Huckle was sentenced for his crimes. Richard Huckle was convicted of uh, being a predatory paedophile and was given a life sentence and sent to full Sutton. As a high-profile sex offender, Huckle would have to be kept on beast wing for his own protection. I met Richard Huckle when he moved on to our unit. He was a very quiet man which doesn't really surprise me considering how infamous he was and everybody knew what he'd done. His crimes were especially heinous. Even amongst other sex offenders, he was not popular with anybody, prisoners or staff. With his crimes so well documented, surely this criminal would want to keep a low profile. He was not shy about his crimes. He was almost proud of it. And I think that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. I really disliked Richard Huckle. I thought he was evil for what he'd done. As a notorious offender, this inmate would have had a target on his back. Huckle, you've got to expect that. As a sex offender, you're on borrowed time. It was no secret amongst a few of the prisoners that there was an attempt to be made on his life. The inmate who decided to take revenge on the wing's most reviled man was convicted rapist Paul Fitzgerald. On the 13th of October. So, <laughs> you would think, obviously, because obviously he's on the, the non swing and that, so obviously there aren't people who are like normal prisoners that are in for murder and robberies and that. They're not going to be there to, to get to him, so I get it. But you would have think the person that is going to do something to him is going to be a normal guy and somehow he got to him or whatever really. No, it's going to be a rapist as well. October 2019, Fitzgerald entered Huckle's cell and effectively kept him hostage for, well, an hour and 18 minutes without anyone noticing. The difference in a top security prison is how far it goes in a normal prison. If someone's running in your cell, they're running in your cell to... They're just going to mash you up, maybe poke you up, and then that's it. Just have a fight in a top security prison. People are running in your cell to try and stab you up and kill you. 
during that time, he subjected Huckle to the most extraordinary torture and beating. He tied him up, tied his feet, tied his hands, gagged him, raped him, stuffed a blade on a piece of wood up his nose so that it reached his brain, stuck a spoon into his anus. I mean, it's almost unbelievable. From my understanding, there was a few other people who were aware of what was going on and so could keep watch, could tell other people not to press the bells. And it's probably some of the prison guards as well. They were probably in on it. So until somebody quite literally stumbled across what was going on, an alarm bell wouldn't be rung. If anybody wanted to assault anybody or do anything of that nature, it was quite easy to do. You could have been in there beaten half to death if that was somebody's wish. A bell went off in a prison when an alarm bell goes. Any free staff, regardless of where they work, are expected to attempt to attend the alarm. Prison officers, sometimes I think they'll wait until there's backup. And then when all the other officers come, then they'll run to the incident and then they'll deal with it. It depends on the inmate, who the person is, and how many dangerous people are on that wing. It just all depends on the situation. We arrived at the wing. Almost immediately, we were sent back. Um, and it wasn't till that evening that we were told um, that he'd been killed in his cell. As a sex offender, you will definitely, definitely get your comeuppance. 100%. No surprises there that he got it. Fitzgerald claimed that it was a good thing, that he was doing the right thing, and he wanted to give Huckle a taste of his own medicine, see how they suffered, you're going to suffer too. When he was found straddling Huckle's body with a pool of blood around Huckle's head, he claimed that he wanted to cook and eat parts of Richard Huckle. I suspect that it had nothing to do with making him feel how others felt. I suspect he was a good old-fashioned monstrous attack. And perhaps he wanted to become famous for the man who killed Britain's worst paedophile. With Huckle dead, questions were asked as to how an attack could last 78 minutes in such a high secure environment. Yeah, the prison gods. Full Sutton is asked to cope with some of the most dangerous men in the country, and it must be safe and secure. There has to be a suspicion that someone knew something about what was going to happen to Richard Huckle. It's a bleak thought, but it's very difficult to avoid that conclusion. But despite committing horrendous crimes, did Huckle deserve better protection? There's no question. Hell no. What about the protection of the six-month-old that, yeah? And them little girls and that. No way. The man fucking got was, was um, charged with 91 offences, but got, got done for 70 offences and that. If a man's getting charged for 91 offences, know that there was probably 200, yeah? That even a wicked, evil man like Richard Huckle deserved protection. Sa no way, I disagree. Safety is one of the principles that every prison should work by. What about the safety of the children that he violated? And the fact that it, he was killed by a fellow sex offender is a terrible commentary on the safety of prisoners. Next, after serving long sentences, how do inmates leaving Full Sutton adapt to the outside world? I used to be scared to get out sometimes. I had a, a serious capacity to self-destruct. Then I got put under surveillance. Your name's never going to be the same again. Yeah, so that's being institutionalised where people can't adapt to the outside world and that. Since it first opened, Full Sutton has been a jail with a troubled history. But with lessons learned from the past, does this prison have a promising future? Today, I believe it's a lot better. Over the years, 
Phil Sutton has kind of changed. Since the introduction of uh, probably better, better managed prison officers and the introduction of schemes to try and deal with some of the underlying problems of particularly uh, dangerous prisoners, uh, things seem to have calmed down. The most recent yeah, inspection report calls it safe, remarkably safe, uh, and well run high security prison. So, yes, it has a checkered past, but it has seemed to have got back onto its feet and is doing what it was being asked to do. And if you're an inmate here, it's likely that you'll be serving a long sentence. But once you've done your time, adjusting to the outside world can prove to be a whole new challenge. When I finally got released from prison, I was released as a Category A prisoner. So I had our station dog escort me to the gate and put handcuffs on me in the gate. And then I had police take me to the hostel and then I got took her out of handcuffs. I was on surveillance for six months, covert surveillance. And these are all stuff where I had to navigate to make sure I didn't go back to prison. I was so institutionalised that I, I used to be scared to get out sometimes, and when I got out, I couldn't last because I couldn't cope with the outside world. One of my biggest struggles. One of the greatest prison films is called Shawshank Redemption. And basically, there was an old man called Brooks. He was like 70 or 80 years old. He'd been in jail for like 40, 50 years. And, uh, and when he got released, he couldn't cope with the outside world. You know, he did. The room he was renting or whatever, he wrote on the wall, Brooks was here or something, hung himself, couldn't cope with the outside world. He tried to, I think, I think, I think he tried to rob someone or something or something like that. He tried to get himself put back in prison. I don't know, it didn't work or whatever, and he just decided to just top off himself. Certain man can't, can't cope with the outside world after being institutionalised for so long. Is socialising. When I'm around groups of people, I just turn into a different person sometimes because I just don't know how to cope with their emotional experiences. The night before I used to go home, I used to lie in my bed and think, if you can do this, if you don't rob, you don't burgle, you don't steal. But I had a, a serious capacity to self-destruct and ruin any chances of anything good for myself. I thought I'd come out and half start off where I left off, and it, that's not going to work. I realised I couldn't be what I used to be, and life's moved on and all that's passed, you know. But the old habits you've learned from prison life can be hard to lose. Prison makes you hypervigilant. It makes you see people in their worst light because you're looking for threats. I've been quite lucky. Since I got out of jail, I'll get lots of help. I mean, my parole officer and that, they give me lots of help. I have a psychiatrist and a psychologist who really work hard to try and pick that 30 years in prison. What did they think I was going to be like when I got out? You know? I mean, full set of maximum security, done my brain in. How you can ever be well after such a long experience of experiencing those kind of feelings day in and day out for years and years and years is beyond me because I even go places outside here now and I'm tense and I'm thinking there's no reason to be tense. But you live in that way for so long, it becomes second nature. You need good people around you when you come out of prison. In this country, they just lock you up and then let you out with the threat of locking you up again, and that's it. <laughs> Nothing's done, nothing's changed. It's down to you to change yourself, blood. And as a former inmate, you may not be the only one struggling with life outside the prison walls. Myself and a lot of prison staff struggled and still struggle in the outside world. You notice yourself getting nervous in crowded spaces, checking over your shoulder. A lot of staff in there changed the way they parent because of who they worked with and, and what happened. People who don't work in prisons, who don't see prisoners, who don't see 
the levels of violence that these people can commit day to day don't fully understand the sort of things you deal with. Full Sutton has had a lasting impact on those who lived and worked inside its high walls. But did this prison change inmates for the better? The judge who sentenced me, he told me prison was going to change my life and make me a better person. No, it didn't at all. There was no one in Full Sutton or maximum security to say, you know what, you can be better than this. I saw people who were damaged, people who were brutalised, people who were traumatised by their past, and all they could do was continue that, that spiral. Each time I came out with no plan, I continued and continued in the same way for all those years and years and years. It just feels like a complete waste of life. I think it's important that we start looking at how we can actually change the people help them a little bit more because they will be getting out and they will be amongst us. If you get the right role models in prison who know you, get to know you, and know where your thinking is wrong and can guide you step by step, bit by bit, spotting talents, abilities in you that all of us have as individuals and get you into that. Teach yourself something new, education, reading, life skills, do whatever you've got to do that, that's going to make sure that you're not going to go back to your old ways when you get out. But ultimately, jail became my home. It's part and parcel of the game that I chose and the lifestyle that I chose to live. I understand the need to put people in jails like Full Sutton. People want to feel that they're getting their justice. But if people demand that people are sent to prison just for the fact of revenge, this spiral, this circle, nothing stops that. What did I learn from Full Sutton? I learned how to survive. That's it. Two independent investigations found no concerns about staff at the time of Richard Huckle's death. A recent independent report highlighted satisfactory resettlement work. So Richard Huckle was obviously the guy that was the paedophile that went over to Malaysia or whatever in it and you know, was violating the children and the one that got murdered in the prison. So just in case you forgot. For those released directly from Full Sutton, a prison service spokesperson said the claims made are unfounded. A recent independent report highlighted good relationships between staff and prisoners. Right, that's it for today, man. Interesting documentary on HMP Full Sutton. Stay wise, ton, though.